Good afternoon, Geneva. I'm excited to be here introducing you to this afternoon's or this morning's big issue debate titled Cognitive Business and the Future of Financial Services. As our industry, along with every other vertical, are becoming more and more digital, what considerations, strategies, and tools are required to drive the necessary differentiation to your value to your customers and your business? We need a new class of systems, ones that understand, reason, and learn in combination with your business systems and functions. And our keynote speaker, Ginny Rometty, is leading IBM and its clients to the era of cognitive business. In fact, her company has made significant advancements with natural language processing, machine learning, automated reasoning with their Watson Cognitive Solutions. Ginny began her career uh, as a systems engineer in 1981 back in Detroit and became chairman, president, and CEO in 2012. As the leader of IBM, she has focused on the company's efforts on cognitive solutions, cloud platforms, and industry expertise. Mrs. Rometty serves on the Council of Foreign Relations, the Board of Trustees at her alma mater, Northwestern University, and the Board of Overseers and Board of Managers at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Following Ginny's keynote, Dean Garfield, CEO of the Information Technology Industry Council, will join the stage to moderate our panel discussion. And in addition to Ginny as a panelist, we will also be joined by Sergio Armati, Group CEO of UBS. So please join me in a warm welcome to with Ginny join the stage. Craig, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. thank you, Craig. And thank you for reminding everyone how old I am by giving that. He didn't say what year Sergio joined and got out of school. Thank you. So we'll add, that'll be Dean's first question, I think. So look, let me, um, let me thank you. Let me thank you all for joining us. Um, but more than anything, you are a really important group of clients to us. And I was looking at some data. And uh, for one of you in the audience, we've served you for 100 years. So I really do appreciate it. And I want to start there by thanking you for how much uh, you trust us. And as the uh, sign below here or behind me said, I'm going to eventually talk about cognitive business. But let me just first maybe make a few comments. You know, we've worked with Cybos 40 years. So since it got started, and I'm actually the first IBM CEO to speak here today. So it's quite an honor, and I wanted you to know the reason I'm here is we care deeply about the financial services industry, and in fact, want to help you strengthen it and take it to the future. And I have to tell you, it's not lost on, my, on me, and in fact, Sergio and I were talking about this, the unprecedented change that's out there right now, whether it's compliance, it's regulation, whether it's new tech, new entrants, whether it is just new demands for customers, and I also want to say that I know how much many of you in your firms are already doing. And so whether it's you're shedding core businesses or you are building new ecosystems with partners, maybe it's a new play payment system. I know yesterday you had a session on cybersecurity and whether or not it's just work you're doing with big data at large, all that by watching and watching that someone doesn't disintermediate you, I know it is a challenge. Now, that said, maybe uncharacteristic to some of the other sessions, I'm not going to just talk about challenges. I actually want to persuade you of three things, and I want to persuade you overall, though, that this is a moment of opportunity, if you choose to seize it. Now, when I say I want to persuade you of three things, I, they're really why I'm optimistic for this industry. The first is, in fact, Craig, you made a comment about this. He said, we're all becoming digital. I'm going to come back to that. But your digital platform, I think, is about to get stronger, and I'm going to share with you why. Second, then, is my belief that your ultimate competitive advantage will come from what we do call cognitive. And the third is, actually, for the world and industry, I believe financial services can lead the way into this era, and I'll explain why. So let me start being sure everyone is awake here. I want to ask a question. It's related to Craig's opening. So if I asked you, how many of you are digital already or working on becoming digital in your firm? How many people would raise your hand? 
Okay. This is, you know, it's like a trick question. It's everyone, everyone would do that. And partly just waking you up here, but if I go around the world, and what I mean by digital, you think about things like cloud, mobility, all of this data, I would get the same answer. And in fact, we've done thousands of engagements with clients, and I would tell you there's commonality. In fact, Sergio and I were talking about this point. Many people are focused on very data-rich, what I would call analytic-powered apps, particularly on the front end of dealing with consumers and customers. Many of you talk about hybrid cloud, public and private cloud, using both of them in your company. And by the way, it's not a religious war. It is not about choice. It is a reality that you will use both of them. It's just a reality of regulations, of security, of privacy, of where your current investments are. And then third thing everybody's working on is security. Again, you had this discussion yesterday. In fact, I believe that digital foundation is really, really important. It's critical. We are very, very high on conviction about it. We've invested a lot of money in this. And in fact, as you look at the IBM company, we're over $80 billion in revenue, and already almost 40% of that revenue, 38 to be exact, 38% and 31 billion is around helping you become digital. So I think of the Digital Foundation as very important, evidenced by what you're doing in our actions, but it won't just stop at those kinds of technologies. It's gonna to continue to evolve, and in fact, front and center, in my first topic, when I said it's gonna get stronger, I wanna talk about blockchain. Now, there'll be many other technologies to come, but in particular, this. And I was, uh, I was saying to one of my team, I remember on Friday, I was at a board meeting, and on one side of me was someone who had invested in 22 companies on blockchain, and another side was one of you who was doing a very interesting pilot on some, I will call it creating a new business around this. So this idea of a blockchain is part of your digital foundation. I think it's gonna be essential and it's gonna make you more powerful. So that's what I meant when I said the thought that the digital foundation you all raised your hand on, I think is about to get stronger. Now, a little bit of background to this. When I say blockchain, I am not talking about Bitcoin. That's how most people heard about it to begin with. I'm not talking about a cyber currency. What I'm talking about is there's an underlying technology beneath that, that my simple definition is, it allows you to have trust and efficiency in the exchange of anything. Now, so just think about that. I believe, like some other technologies, this one will have a profound change in how the world works. And I mean how the world works. And if you just look at supply chains alone, our estimates are efficiency could be over $100 billion of improvement. But then you add things like traceability, like having real authenticity, you add things like trade finance, you add things like any money laundering, tracking, and then the value gets into hundreds of billions of dollars for this digital foundation that will be strengthened with this technology. And in fact, it builds trust, which I think everybody would agree at this point in time, that is something the world needs more of. So an analogy I'd ask you to think about is that the blockchain will do for transactions what the internet did for information. So just maybe think about that, and it's worth repeating. The blockchain will do for transactions what the internet did for information. And there'll be some key principles that go in place to make this happen. Because just like the internet, there's gonna have to be governance, there's gonna have to be standards. Blockchains will have to be immutable, meaning you can't change, and you can't change them, you can't delete them. There are some people who believe you should be able to change them. We don't prescribe to that. There's ways to make corrections without changing them. And then only permissible, permissible transactions can be done. And when you work on those things, this will be for serious business. And so I'll just throw in, we've been doing some things to help really industrialize this, particularly for this industry. One is work around, in fact, making sure the blockchain can be open, secure, secure scalable, and in fact, if I can just put a plug in as an aside, this industry has always worked, and you guys, as Swift and Cybos have often talked about standards, 
I'll put a plug in for something the Open Source Foundation is doing. And it's actually the Linux Foundation. The project's called Hyperledger. And maybe you've talked about it or it's been in some of your sessions. Think of it as the fabric that has the standards for all of the blockchain apps that could be built in the future. And in fact, it should be open source because it's got to become a standard. We were one of the founding members when there were only 17 people. We donated 45,000 lines of code. Today, there's almost 100 members and 600 more in line. So I would encourage you, I mean, this is how the World Wide Web happened. It's why things and standards like HTML came about, that you have this basic fabric. And then we'll go on and create things like platforms to help you build blockchain applications, whether they be on the IBM cloud, whether they be in your own systems like your mainframes, which many of you run your banks and financial institutions on. And we're offering actually already even, uh, I would call it an ability for you to have a factory to really accelerate some of the efforts here. You'll find we call them garages, and they are in New York, London, Singapore, San Francisco, and Toronto, around the world. So more important though, when I said this foundation's gonna get stronger, let me give you some examples to illustrate this. We've done well over 300 engagements with clients on blockchain. So these are just examples, but I hope it brings it to life and why it would be worth me talking about on a main tent stage like this. So one is an example for foreign exchange settlement. In fact, we just announced this work with CLS. I think you all know CLS yesterday. And it's using blockchain and a distributed lever, ledger to help transform what they do. And as you know, this will be efficiency, risk, liquidity, improved, and they settle five trillion US dollars of trades a day. So FX settlement, pretty clear how it works. Smart contracts, I wanna use that word. Work that we're doing with Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, UFG, Think of this as the use of blockchain. Anytime you have to manage contracts, multi-party contracts, and have service level agreements. In fact, we, they are a banker to us, and we'll be doing a number of transactions now through the blockchain with them. Another area, identity management, KYC. You all have to work on this. So Credit Mutual has gone ahead and done their first efforts around KYC to verify you know, the bona fides of a customer. They're doing it in one part and now gonna go cross the bank to do that. And then the other, another clear example, is really clear example is trade finance. Bank of America, HBSC, and in fact in Sing Singapore, Singapore at large, we are doing this work. And just think of streamlining the paperwork that goes with import, export. Those of you that touch any of this know how much paperwork is. So I wanted to start before I jumped into cognitive so that that digital foundation you're building, it is gonna get stronger. And this is one area, one, it's not even just a technology. As I said, it's an enabler for any transaction to be trusted between parties to happen. I wanna bring your attention to it. But now, the second reason I'm optimistic. You know, I asked you, and you all raised your hands when I said, okay, you're working on being digital. But let me ask you a second question. When everyone's digital, who wins? Digital's a foundation, but I don't think it's the destination. And I think you've got to start to think that way. Because there's another shift that's right in front of you, and I actually believe it is going to be more transformative and more disruptive. And this is what the session was called. It's what we call cognitive business. And maybe put simply, if you take a digital business and you add digital intelligence to it, and Craig, you mentioned Watson, it's emblematic of this era, you would get a cognitive business. It's a business model and a technology model. And in fact, therefore, I think more of cognitive as a destination. And that's why my second point to you is, I would really like you to think about that the ultimate competitive advantage is being cognitive. Because the advantage will go to those who can really get and extract the insights of all the information we all talk about. You know, I say one day we're gonna look back. Eras are often named, ERA eras are often named in retrospect. We'll look back to this time and it will be data people will talk about. And in fact, I've often used the analogy that you'll think of it as a natural resource of our era. Now, all that data, the point of bringing it up is you are gonna need some new 
era, some new technology, we call it cognitive, to deal with that data. You know, most of the data in the world, 80% of it, is really invisible to systems today, in systems and technology, meaning it's video, it's sound, it's motion, it's tweets, it's sensors, it's pictures. It's including, by the way, invisible, a lot of things you store, your accumulated knowledge that you have stored, but you get no value out of it. There's deep insights in there, but you need something different to understand what that is. And so if I had to simply describe what cognitive was to you, it is an era of systems that understand, they reason, and they learn, just like the way you and I think. And so in other words, when we're asked a question, we think, we understand it, we compare it to all the knowledge and facts we know, we decide how confident we are, we have a degree of confidence, we either know an answer or we know a set of answers that possibly it could be, and that's what these systems start to do. And therefore, they learn just like you and I. So that is what, when you said again, Watson, that's what we're doing here. As a system, it's a completely different era that does that. And we use the word cognitive for a really important reason. This is far more than artificial intelligence. Most people associate artificial intelligence with machine learning. Machine learning is one of 50 things when we think of cognitive. Some of the major attributes are you can interact in natural language. You, in fact, have domain knowledge. I know insurance, I know underwriting, I know medicine, I know a particular compliance area. So you're taught that and you interact with these systems. In fact, I don't think of them as artificial intelligence. I think of them as augmenting intelligence. And therefore, these systems learn. And it's at a time when most of what we're gonna face going forward, you're gonna need systems that learn. The challenges are too big otherwise. So whether it's to understand consumer behavior, public safety, interconnected financial markets, or whether it is something, everything is digitized and interconnected. And so you can't program, as we all sort of lived in a world where things were programmed, too many combinations. They can't be programmed. Hence the idea of cognitive has to do with cognitive overload. You know, as, as a consumer, I'll tell you a, a fact I think everybody can identify with. If you went back to the mid-1990s, if you were a big retailer and you went to shop online, they might have a half a million things for you to look at. Today a big retailer, 24 million. It's just a sign of this overload. So you'll build learning into your processes, risk, compliance. I'm gonna come back to these different areas. You're gonna build learning into them. And by the way, this will be the first technology you have that's gonna be worth more over time than less over time. And I'll be as bold as to say that if what you have is digital today, it will be cognitive tomorrow. I mean, I've seen some statistics that say 50% of new things being created in your company today, by 2018, 50% will have some form of cognition in them. This idea of augmented intelligence, it helps you deal with the gray area. And it will impact everyone, from every day to being able to do things that are unsolvable. So just to give you a feel for kind of the range of the impact it'll have on our lives, uh, Sergio and I were talking about this. I said, Watson today is in 45 countries in 20 different industries. So on one hand, we started our work in healthcare, in oncology, one of the most difficult areas, trained by the best oncologists in the world. Those systems are now rolling out across 35 healthcare systems in Southeast Asia to diagnose and treat just four basic cancers. You would never have the opportunity to have world-class care and world-class sort of parameters around cancer care in other parts of the world, even in developed countries. That's one. Or if you're a retailer, Macy's, you're walking through a store, and in some of those stores now, with Watson's help, you're told and you can interact with it. What do you like? And it gets smarter and smarter as you like, don't like things, and offers them to you. We're working with lawyers, lawyers to help them with a cognitive assistant. So like doctors, they spend their time what they should be doing and that this helps go through things like bankruptcy rules and regulations. Or if you have children, you would understand the work we're doing with Sesame Street. How does a child learn? You understand that and then pick the videos that adjust to how your child learns. Or crazy things like cooking, uh, movie trailers, uh, we have done fashion design, it's even proved if it can be digitized, you can even drive creativity out of that. So, 
My second point, as I said, is that this ultimate competitive advantage is going to come from this capability. But there is no industry, I think, riper for this than financial services. And that brings me to my third and last point, the point that financial services, I believe, can and will lead the world into this era. You know, it is worth, for some of you, some of you, I can tell, have been around a little bit, some maybe not, but it's worth thinking back in time. It's actually financial services that has led every other major area of technology. So, in all of mankind, there's really only been two prior. There was a whole generation of things that counted, tabulated. Second generation was program. Everything you have, your phone, you name it, is programmable today. It's got to be told what to do. And by the way, banks, when those came out decades ago, that's how the banking back office got created. And this third generation is cognitive, things that'll learn. So let me just give you some examples of where I see this coming to life in your industry. Uh, Bradesco, big bank in Brazil. They're using it in their call center. Portuguese, all dialects, understands it, been trained on all 59 products, therefore able to answer questions clients have about the products. Go to a smaller bank, Hong Leong Bank in Malaysia. In this case, it's to recognize the caller intent before he ever speaks to someone in the bank or she. RBS, work on a digital advisor for small medium business been trained to answer all questions, many questions, that a small medium business has, either through someone serving them or direct. Alpha Modus Research, another go to a different end, a startup. They predict patterns of market behavior. They do predictions of market closes on US equities. They use this, they've been training, 500% improvement in their predictions. But there's also an area that I think is incredibly important. You'll see this technology, and perhaps one of the first areas is risk and compliance. And we are doing work with a number of you in the audience on risk and compliance. So let me just give you some statistics to get a feel for how much, and it's an area that if you could do it better for less, it's what you want to do. So regulation management. I just saw a report for one of you that had 82% accuracy on obligations, discovering the obligations out of many different kinds of documents, relating to a 30% reduction in the legal and compliance area around that. Any money laundering with another one of you, tens of millions of transactions, obviously improving the ability to both monitor and do the link analysis. And then some interesting work on payments fraud. So for a bank, another happens to be another bank in France, 4.75, as I remember, billion transactions real time through it. And in fact, I think it's 75% of the credit card through that country. And for the first time in a decade, putting it through this learning technology, credit card actual fraud rates declined. So to do this kind of work, what we're gonna do, and we have done with it just a month ago, we actually set up a unit just targeted at these kind of solutions, Watson Financial Services. Um, in addition to all we do to serve you today, this is targeted at these new platforms that will evolve all around cognitive, around cloud, around blockchain pulled together. Because, for a really important reason, which I'll end on, I hope you see, I believe strongly the basis of competition has already been reset and is gonna be reset again. And it's only gonna accelerate over the next five years. And every major decision you're gonna make as an institution is going to have assistance from some sort of underpinning of a cognitive engine. And you will either be disrupted or you will be the disruptor. Now, I know most of you, you choose the latter. Not most, you all choose the latter. So let me thank you for allowing me to introduce this to you. Let me thank you for all the work that you do with the IBM company. I appreciate the relationship we've had with Swift all of these years. But more than anything, as I said when I started, I'm very grateful for the trust that you put in us. We have been part of your past, and we look forward to continuing to be part of your future. So with that, let me uh, end my remarks and bring Dean up here to join us. So thank you. Am I in my right seat? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you are. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Great job. Sir, here you uh, as Ginny suggested, we've, we've got a little less than 40 minutes for this conversation, so I'm going to jump right in with what year did you graduate? 
I'm kidding. No, go right ahead. <laughs> Come on, Sergio. So I, I know you, you're a CEO who has worked at essentially every level in the banking industry, and I'll give away that you, I think you started at Merrill Lynch in 1987, uh, when the technology at the time was probably not cognitive computing, but perhaps telex. Uh, I'm curious, just your thinking about how the banking industry has evolved and how cognitive and computing is impacting what you're doing today. Uh, thank you. Um, well, actually, I started in 1975 as an apprentice. And, uh, well, I think I remember in the early stages of my apprenticeship, I was uh, fascinated by uh, the securities and foreign exchange department. And I got a chance to start to trade and execute orders using a telex. <laughs> Actually, so I was right. <laughs> I was, I, I literally, I remember uh, buying and selling uh, dollar Swiss francs uh, with 20 bips spread, <laughs> and uh, where five millions were considered a large size. <laughs> and going through a telex and buying and selling. So I saw fax, the fax machine being introduced and being totally fascinated about, my God, I can focus on doing some things I like to do rather than doing stupid things. So I think that when I go into this kind of discussions, um, and, 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 and now artificial intelligence uh, will uh, uh, evolve, uh, I think that uh, I also agree with Ginny that it's the positive part of the equation because, in essence, this technology, the development of technology over the years has allowed people to focus on more interesting part of the value chain and enhance productivity and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and intellectual content. So I, I, I do think that is inevitable. Uh, I do uh, agree that uh, we, uh, as I say, that we have to embrace technology. We shouldn't be afraid about this uh, evolution uh, because uh, you know, we have been living with technology developments in our industry and we have been able to actually make, uh, uh, make out of it a competitive uh, advantage. Uh, Ginny, you know, Ginny, Dean, yeah, just please. Sergio and I were talking, and I think it's worth uh, making a point that uh, we both agree on, which is that there's much discussion about these technologies on the front end of how they help, obviously, interface with consumers, customers. But we both agree there is such a, I'll say gold mine, but such a benefit in the back office, the mid office, and that's really untapped for the most part. And so I think it's fair enough to say we're, that's, we're both yeah. excited about that. Yes. Can you say more about that? You, you made the point that you thought in five years every decision will, be, will involve cognitive computing, or most decisions will be. Yeah, well, I, I think the way I think of it, first off, it's a journey. It's a journey. So this isn't like you flip a light switch and this is what happens. And that's very true of most journeys in technology. You start, you do something, it grows over time. So A, it's a journey. B, as I even think about my own company and where to apply it, I can sort of in, put in buckets in my mind the areas I look. On one hand, it will be the front end. You can get a deeper client relationship because of this. I look at the work that... Um, that we're doing with Geico, a big insurance company, and where they use Watson, you get a far better understanding and therefore a far better result with a customer. I view still front end, you'll do things that are, um, think of it as scaling expertise in your company. That might be call centers, but that could be risk. That could be how you make any kind of decision where it's expert based, you're gonna be assisted. And we can come back to this. This is not about replacing people. This is about making better decisions, right? The third area is where I said you could put learning in any product. I mean, it will be, some will be things you're gonna try. Mizuho has cognitive concierge robots when you walk into some of the branches uh, to deal with questions. Now, part of that is a labor shortage and skill that's in Japan. So there's, there's real reason for that to be accepted. Um, the other one though, I mentioned risk compliance. I mean, I envision, continuous compliance. I see some of the work people are doing in this area that you could actually, both, both from a risk and compliance perspective, have real-time monitoring and assessment of this and have a real-time position on it. And then the other is for discovery. I mean, think of how many companies you do business with in that you'll use this technology we have something called the company analyzer to go look at all their connections and then everybody they do business with and their risk profiles. So 
anything under the discovery umbrella. So I think there are many different ways that this technology will be applied, but there'll be one, I think, even more important decision you'll make as you get started. And again, Sergio and I have talked about this, that um, learn from other industries. Make your decisions carefully about both partnerships and the ownership of your data. I, I really believe what I said about this era is going to be determined, your success will be determined by information. It'll be the basis of competition. And therefore, you want to work on, and I think it's important to have a business model that, as an example, we bring Watson, we bring data, you bring data, you bring your analytics, but the insights belong to you. That isn't how all companies work. I believe that's important for people to make that decision about their insight governance, governance and ownership as they start down this journey, or unless you want somebody else's system getting smarter and trained with your data. Is that, I think it's a fair Sergey, point. Sergey, how are you thinking about your data and as well as the operational opportunities here? I know you've been advocating uh, for the concept of a super bank, and I wonder how this fits within that. Well, I, I, I've been advocating for a super back office, right? Not yeah, that's different bank. than yeah. sharing super all your data. Right. No, I, I do think that, uh, of course, you know, as Jeannie was mentioning before, you know, we are all fascinated and we are talking about fintech and technology in, 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 a, in a client, in a, from a client standpoint of view, which is, you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, I do think that uh, we, we all enjoy talking about that and, and making our clients' experience more efficient. But the truth of the matter, if I think about our industry, uh, half, you know, a big chunk of the people working and the cost associated with banking is in the back end. Yeah. And it's the part that needs to be addressed because we have legacy systems, legacy technologies that are actually not able to keep up with the complexity uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the new regulations and the amount of transactions. You know, Reuters is publishing every year statistics uh, where they basically say that a global bank of, of our size is getting exposed to around 40,000 alerts or changes of regulations a year. Wow. So now, no matter how good you are as a compliance person or as a business person, you won't be able to catch up and be compliant with all those rules going forward. The only way is to get some, some things to help you, to allow you to focus on, on, on the critical part of the equation. But also, you know, uh, the inefficiencies uh, uh, that, you know, uh, a very intense uh, 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 interaction with true humans also leads to errors. Right. And, and nowadays, I can tell, I mean, uh, when I think about our, one of our biggest risks, actually I can say our biggest risks in our industry is no longer market risk or credit risk, is operational risks. Being errors in good faith or driven by misbehaviors. And we need tools that allow us to be in front and very efficient in addressing those issues. And then, and then how do you, how do you create differentiated value in that world? Well, I think that, you know, first of all, we have to pay attention not to pretend to be a technology company and, and, and to reinvent everything from scratch. Our industry, and our, I think our bank, is a big user of technology. When I hear about some of, uh, uh, of my peers talking about feeling themselves like a technology company, I'm not so sure we can be a technology company. We are a big user and we need to uh, you know, define exactly what is our contribution in the value chain through technology rather than reinventing ourselves things that can be done more efficiently by people who have an unregulated environment around them, first of all, and also benefiting from economy of skills and, and, and knowledge that can uh, be brought together. In, es in essence, our business, 70-80% of, of the value chain is commoditized. It's the last mile that makes a difference. Content, relationships, advice. And we, our contribution has to be to try to make our uh, uh, processes efficient and effective so that we can both unlock value to shareholders because you know, as you all know here, 
there are few banks in the world that are able right now to pay for their cost of capital. So eventually, you need to find ways to get more efficient. And or because of new technology, because of new entrants coming in play, you need to pay attention to your top line. So you need to you know, be able to be more efficient also to, to compete from a pricing standpoint of view. So that's our focus, right? right? Really fighting those two dimensions. But uh, we should really pay attention not to pretend to be a technology company. Because nobody knows, by the way, how the world is going to look like in five to 10 years. We all know only one thing. It's going to be much different. Yeah. So you need to be agile and flexible in how you make your choices. I see you smiling at that. Well, Go no, ahead. I, not, you would say, of course, she agrees with him. I mean, that's not my point. But the point that I think that, uh, Sergio, that I do agree, this issue about scale and it's true for all of us about picking partners in that, you know, I look at what we invest in a year to example, build our cloud, our big public cloud, that it's going to be impossible for other people to keep up. There'll be very few people that will be able to do that. And so where, on the other hand, you use data, you use technology, so you need to work on the parts that are differentiating, right? And then take advantage of what other people do is what Sergio is describing. And I think we're in a moment that many people can be confused on that topic, right? And so, um, you know, should I be building all of this myself? Do I partner? And that's why I think some of the partnering, you're going to have to make some important decisions. As I said, we've chosen to protect your privacy, protect your data, allow those insights be yours. You'll make some strategic decisions now about who you choose to work with based on those kinds of things. So then you focus on the part that is really your domain that you have all that expertise in, right? Versus the non-differentiating pieces. So one strategic decision that has to be made is around blockchain, and you described it, Ginny, as the foundation for the digital, this digital transition that's happening. Uh, why is IBM working with the Linux Hyperledger uh, Foundation on, on their initiative? The, the, this, is a, in this is a good example about something that um, Sergio was saying, where Things that need to be shared, the industry needs to work on them together. And blockchain has a promise of such value, but not unless there are standards out there in a pervasive deployment of something. Our experience goes way back, because together we built all these transaction systems with everybody in the room here. Um, but there are standards out there about how that could be, so all the railroads could connect together. So our interest in blockchain, where we could see what promise it was, but we also knew if there wasn't going to be a global shared standard, it will be hard to take off on this. And that in the world you live in, it would have to have things like you know, different forms of visibility. I said permissioned. Um, regulators are going to have to be comfortable that, that you can't have an opaque view of this. So the kinds of things for serious work to be done, and again, I'm not on a digital currency, but you have to have the ability to be sure the blockchain can't be tampered with. You have to be absolutely sure that the um, permissionable people can participate at different levels. And so we spend a lot of time with regulators and central banks in the world describing what this means, because if we can get that done right with standard set, then the industry can flourish by what Sergio said is, then they work on the applications they want to put on top of this, not on building the, what's below the surface that everybody should share. So that's why we are so strong. This is, by the way, the fastest growing open source project that, that the Linux Foundation has ever had. So that tells you something about what the interest is and the promise people see. You know, when you don't have to push something and instead it's pulled, the, the promise of what people see. And I think this industry understands well the benefit of standards for things that they know they'll then get great economies out of, right? Yeah, and I know that UBS, for example, is doing a lot of work around this in California and donating some of the the code from your blockchain efforts to HIV, uh, to helping to find an HIV cure? Well, I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's part of our efforts to, to stay close to, uh, to, to the topic, also in terms of, uh, if you think about uh, contributing to a society in a wider aspect, I think that on one end we do those kind of initiatives, on the other end we are very close to develop uh, you know, uh, the usage of blockchain for effects transactions and, and, and what we discussed, uh, 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 you discussed in, uh, in, in, your, in your remarks. So for us, it's really uh, about uh, uh, evolving into the next uh, uh, 
uh, phase of, of how to define the financial services industry without pretending to know literally right. or to try to invent some things. I mean, I, I really have my doubt that somebody is going to be able to put a patent, uh, a way to say this is a proprietary way to do blockchain. It's going to be like the, the internet, right? So some things that is going to be used everywhere only to give certainty and standards, yeah. not to create the facto through that a competitive advantage is something that you really benefit from in a, in a collective way that goes well beyond financial uh, institutions and, and I think it's probably also going to help uh, facing uh, the issues of uh, uh, criminality and, 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 and know your clients, anti-money laundering. So hopefully we're going to have also some positive developments for society. In that you, you've actually both alluded. Ginny, go ahead. Well, no, my, was, my job is just to make sure you keep talking, well, so go I, ahead. I was just saying, so <laughs> we, we've actually had some of our own personal experience with this um, because as part of IBM, I have IBM Global Financing, which does about $40 billion of financing a year. So it's its own little bank over here. Uh, no, not a bank. I don't want that to be. I'm not a, I'm not a, I do, it's a We're not making credit news. corp, credit oh, corp. Oh, you know your, you know, no, no. Now I know exactly where you want to go. No, no. <laughs> No. But you're going to get regulated. No, 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 no. <laughs> credit, credit, leasing, <laughs> leasing business. And so what we did was we used blockchain to go ahead and we put our whole ledger up on a blockchain. So we ran it as a shadow ledger for a while, but now we're going into production. And I can see the benefit. Not only, it didn't take me to see the benefits, the team could see the benefits. So any business you do, I guarantee you where there's more than one party, there's a dispute. I mean, when you, unless you're talking to yourself, maybe there is then too, but it's whenever there's more than one person involved. And so with a, a financing business that large, 40 billion, um, we have a huge area that deals with disputes. And that, that would be things like, I don't agree with this tax rate, it was a different country, it should have been like this. I'm telling you, we put up the blockchain, the typical disputes take 40 days to resolve we will be down to one or less. Oh. And the client satisfaction, and of course, you have to have a standard because there's many people on the other end of this, right? So for them to quickly to be able to implement it, we used the Hyperledger as the foundation. We built this for dispute resolution. And it just reminds me of something I've known forever, that when there's one version of the truth, you can get a lot of efficiency. When there, and, and that's what it offers, is one version of the truth. And so, and to me, the business people, it wasn't the IT, or my IT teams that saw the benefit of this, because they said, look, I'm, I'm dealing with 25,000 emails or calls and whatever a month, and this is something very simple. And so we've started there, and I must have two dozen projects in the company wow. in all different areas. Anywhere there's trading of anything between parties where it could be you know, efficiency. So I, I'll obviously a strong believer, because I can see the benefit myself even. Actually, speaking of seeing the benefits, and you've both alluded to an area where this may have an impact, which is the regulatory environment, which is often not aligned on a global basis, which is particularly problematic for companies like yours that, that do deal on a global basis. What's your thinking around the, and you've made the point about banks being heavily regulated, that dynamic now, Sergio, and, and how these sorts of technology, including cognitive computing, can help? Well, first of all, uh, you know, it is clear to me that banks needed to be regulated after what happened in, 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 in 2000, in, in the early part of 2000s, and, and uh, you know, so I'm not against uh, regulation per se, and uh, as, I, as I said, it was totally appropriate to bring some discipline back into the equation. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, regulation being different, you know, I think was always a wishful thinking to think that we would have an harmonized regulation in the world. Usually you have those kind of statements during a crisis moment in which <laughs> everybody talk about how they feel about having a level playing field and one regulation. But the next morning, the truth of the matter is that everybody, every country, every uh, system has uh, their own interest uh, or priorities to protect and uh, the concept of uh, countries and economies being friends, in my point of view, is a little bit of a naive uh, uh, interpretation of the word. Now, the complexity that comes from fragmentation of, 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 of regulation is quite yeah. exponential. As I mentioned before, just this number, 40,000 alerts or changes of regulations that comes in every year. I mean, it tells you the magnitude 
and uh, uh, so I, 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 re I really need to, I need to repeat myself, is that without artificial intelligence, without technology, you won't be able to keep up right. with that complexity. Now, people will say, well, fine, in that case, you should make your business less complex. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the answer we, you get. Let's do the business. Well, the, the reality is that it's not as simple as that, because if you make your business less complex, you know, you're not going to be able to serve your clients. And in essence, uh, you're going to go back into a, 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 a less uh, a, a, a promising story in terms of growth and, and ability to serve, uh, as I mentioned, your, your client base. So regulation, at a point in time, will need to start to think about uh, uh, truly the effects of, of uh, uh, over-regulating one sector. And on the other end, if you think about our, our sector right now, we are facing new entrants that are de facto entering the banking business without having the regulation that goes along with banking system. And we all know that this is inevitable, it's good, actually, you, you create uh, uh, innovation through that, but also it's something that politicians and regulators won't address until they see something negative coming out, because an intervention at this point in time by many new entrants would be like saying we are trying to protect the incumbents. Right. And you know that that's not politically sustainable. But I'm totally convinced that you know, over time, regulation will also go and touch some of the so-called new entrants that are you know, claiming or you know, are, are, are perceived to be cannibalizators of our industry. As I, was, yeah. I was joking to say, well, welcome to the club. If anybody wants to be regulated as a bank, or as a financial institution, just please, uh, um, you know, join join the party. But it's not going to be so easy. I, I'm going to come back to fintech, which I think you were alluding to a second ago. But before I do, Jenny, I, I wonder your thoughts because you you pointed to practical implications, if you will, or deployments uh, of the technology to help with regulation. Yes. Look, I, I just you know, there's probably if if you had to say what's I would guess, I think we, we both agree, one of the number one areas you'd work on is risk and compliance as, as a non-differentiating, but something that it not just about doing it less expensively, it is about doing it better, actually, right? Because it isn't that there shouldn't be risk management and compliance. And so it's how to do it in the most both efficient and the best way. And so I think both of these, again, the reason I, I think it's so important and in, in why we even say it's more than artificial intelligence, this area of cognitive is that you've got to deal with, it isn't about a repetitive machine learning. These, these new regulations, they're in these written forms, they're in these, now try to go discover all the places you have that obligation to deal with that. And so you are gonna need technologies that they don't just know do search and keywords and that kind of thing, they actually have to understand the intent in what is meant. And so this becomes a far more sophisticated exercise than just a keyword search, look up, and this is obviously where, because it, it's not that way in all these documents. And so that's very different. And, and you, we need to take out, in those processes, we need to take out subjectivity. That's right. right. I mean, yeah. the real issue that we are facing today is not necessarily people overlooking. is the subjectivity component in people making a call about interpretation. And we need to have much more uh, standardization and, 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 uh, and knowledge based uh, rather than subjectivity in certain processes. Yeah, yeah see, this is, an, this is a very good, really good and key point because th what, I view, what I see as one of the benefits of this new era is, I say the words, I said it, it deals with the gray areas much better. If this isn't about just black and white. If these were just about looking up yes and no's all the time, this wouldn't be so hard. But this will be an era that will help you deal with the gray area, you, when, right? Because when there's judgment to be applied on something, you would, with then having far more data, I think the answers are going to be way better at the end. I of think the there day. are lots of lawyers. Yeah, but even with yes and no, yeah, even those like, could be improved. It's like too. taking a, a form, and you are used to always saying no, 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 no. Over time, if you ask the same person to do the same job for 
You're right. Months, yeah. years, yeah. you're going to get cognitive d fatigue and you're going to get that. And people won't yeah. pay attention anymore. That's right. That's, that's oh, look, this is, this is, th we saw this come to life in the work we did with medicine, with radiology. If you're a radiologist, probably not any in the audience, but I mean, they spend a, their life looking at millions of films, right? And so you can, one of the number one issues is fatigue. It's exactly what you're describing. I do the same thing over and over and they miss things then, right? And so that's what these system say, whoa, 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 I know that, go look at these three one more time, right? And, and then you help someone to make that decision. I'm sure there are some lawyers in the room who are worried about becoming dispensable, but uh, well, we'll, no, we'll come back. We'll come back. Should, I'm no, not so no. sure it's a bad news, that one. <laughs> <laughs> So b before we turn to those two issues around fintech and, and what this means for the work of the future, I, I know that another uh, uncertainty or complexity in the financial services sector has been cybersecurity. And I, I wonder how you're thinking about that. That is now a CEO issue. Uh, and whether, Ginny, uh, after Sergio goes, whether there are lessons that you've thought about from other industries that may be applicable here. Well, look, you know, I, I think that cyber is not just an issue for, 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 for us, it's for the entire uh, society. I think that, you know, I, I take some relief sometimes when I see those kind of cyber incidents happening, even at uh, the top government levels where you would expect top securities. So it's a very serious uh, uh, matter, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, which is quite indicative on, our, on, on, on how our industry has changed, you know, literally, Market risk and credit risk is no longer the biggest risk we are facing as a bank. That's, a, that's given. So operational risks, which include cyber, right. is a big topic. It's a topic in which you can never, you should never display an overly confident level of certainty that you are protected because uh, it's clearly uh, uh, almost like uh, you don't know exactly what is the possibilities of, of your uh, of your attackers and, 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 and maybe the motivation to prove you the contrary, right, for example. So I think it's a, it's a serious topic that uh, I, I do believe can only be addressed, again, in conjunction with both uh, the technology uh, industry, but also, very, important, uh, very importantly, with our peers and with governments. Yeah. I don't think that you Absolutely. can address cyber in isolation of those three uh, stakeholders. Only by taking together the intelligence, lessons learned, and also making sure that we don't create a, a stigma or a taboo in saying that you have been attacked. I mean, today, if you basically say that you have been attacked, you have to really pay attention because you may be seen by clients, regulators. You're not doing your job. Are, you're not doing your job. Yeah. And, and the reality is that the more you do that, the more you are likely not only uh, to make a bigger problem out of your problem, but also you are not helping the next one on the chain to get protected. It's and in good. turn, so I, I think it's very important that when we talk about cyber that we develop like is defense in, 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 in humankind, I would say, defense was uh, defined by board, defending your borders, defending your security. Now, in the new age, uh, in, in the technology age, defense is, goes beyond physical defense, is the cyber defense. Right. And there, everybody needs to play the same uh, uh, game. Yeah, absolutely. Ginny? Well, I would just add, um, I, the, the analogy you just used, I mean, how I often speak about this is that uh, you have to think about security in this day and age as a big data problem because the bad guy is in. So the idea that you think he's not in is wrong. And that it's, I'll, I'll use a health analogy, you have to have a system that works like your immune system. Meaning, you know, we all have germs in our body. And that you constantly, your immune system is constantly looking for when something gets out of order and it goes and it sort of stops the pain right there before it hopefully spreads somewhere. And so that analogy works both for an individual and then why in the world they set up things like the World Health Organization or the Center for Disease Control was that if one country had an outbreak, you had to have a mechanism to quickly notify everybody else to stop it from spreading. I mean, there's really lessons about yeah. this that you were referring to um, in what you were describing as coordination with other people and the like and other companies. And so if you take that analogy, I think a couple of the biggest learnings are one, you do need to have this collaboration. Um, 
and that's with government and your peers. And it has to be liability free to what uh, Sergio just said. And by the way, because the resource that is the hardest for you to hire is cyber people. So you are also facing this issue of not enough people that even have the skill. So you need, we have something called X-Force. We see 20 billion incidents a day because of what we manage wow. for clients. We see 20 billion a day. So we've applied Watson and cybersecurity to all that. And when we see things, you share it out on this X-Force network with, uh, with everybody in the network, right? So they know what to face. That's one. The second thing, you know, counterintuitive, but moving to cloud technology done properly for financial services, you will actually have more standards and more security than less because there's one way in, one way to do things. So you kind of cordon that off. The other thing is I said this idea about big data. I mean, that is what you're gonna, most people, I believe it or not, most companies, they would have 100 products, 150 products in security from 50 vendors. That would be like putting a different alarm on every window and door in your house and thinking that's gonna work. <laughs> it's not gonna work. And so the big data idea is you're looking for things that are slightly out of place, out of context, and they're the leading indicators, right? So that to me is the future we now face in security. We're the largest enterprise security company. So, so this is near and dear to my heart and for my own company, for clients' companies. And I would add only one other lesson learned. Everybody wants to talk about nation states, I mean, the biggest issue is human error, actually. So before we go off down these other tangents, and you know, even with my, my own employees, I always say, you, you train people, you test them, you trick them, you track them. So, I mean, you keep, have to keep going through this because it is whether, not even all ill intent, accident, is, is the number one issue that you have. And so um, there are basics that go along with this as well. Employee, employee and clients, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Uh, uh, Really working with employees, I mean, it's, it's really a, a top priority for, for us to, to educate employees on how to not to give <laughs> access to potential right. threats and, and, and also clients. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm comfortable that I see technology developments helping, for example, clients to be efficient and not feeling like they have to go through a burden of unnecessary check because technology through... Uh, yep. uh, this great innovations that we are seeing right now is going to allow us to be secure and and still very effective and 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 and, uh, and quick in responding to clients. Uh, um, Absolutely. Immense. Uh, we're running short on time, so I want to ask each of you a slightly distinct question around description. So, Sergio, you, you alluded to financial tech or fintech earlier, and so I'm curious you're thinking of what implications that has for a bank like UBS. And then Ginny, uh, earlier you, we were talking about the implications of cognitive computing and aug augmented intelligence for the workplace uh, and workers and jobs. And so it would be cur I'm curious you're thinking on that as well. Well, so starting uh, with FinTech. Uh, FinTech, uh, again, uh, for us FinTech is a, um, you know, I, I, I look at FinTech as a positive, uh, uh, element, uh, uh, you know, there are few of them who have a mission, declare mission, and you know, we all do respect. They want to disintermediate banks, and they want to, you know, redefine the financial system, and replace the incumbents. But the vast majority of the fintech are people that wants to bring ideas, want, want to work with us in developing uh, 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 new applications and new uh, uh, ways of uh, making our system more effective. Actually, the way we look at fintech, first of all, how do we look at technology uh, uh, developments and, and fintech ideas? We have a very federal model uh, 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 you know, uh, along uh, business lines. We, we try to have a governance as a, at a group level that avoid or minimize uh, duplication of efforts and actually help us to get the best out of uh, each, each other. And actually, we had some good developments. But we have been working with, uh, last year we had a challenge that we launched a global challenge with FinTech, with the FinTech industry, where we invited 600 of them to compete for best ideas. And we gathered 12 finalists, and we picked up the winners. But you know, all of those ideas 
God's traction in the way we are now operating within the bank. That's great. So it's a great example on how you can use fintech as a you know, provider of intelligence without pretending that you're going to invent something. Right. Oh, that's very smart. Yeah, I see a lot. I, I think that is the right way, a healthy way. And I see a lot of clients that are putting in, a, a, you know, put a cloud platform on and they want the fintechs to come and collaborate with them more than anything. And I think that that's a, a great way to bring innovation in, just as you're describing you guys did. Yeah. So the, the future of the workplace. And uh, the workplace. Yeah, called. look, um, I think this is a topic to first just when people talk about what's the impact of technology, impact on jobs, I think it's really important to just reflect on time. I mean, technology has had an impact and it will continue. And if you go back, that's not new, that there'll be some sort of impact, whether it's productivity and that things that were done one way will maybe be done now by systems and then man will do other things as well. And if you go back in time, I, and I, I know this is really back in time, but I think it's a paradigm that's useful to think about when, when most of us farmed, when the agrarian era, what happened when there began to be machinery for farms? People had to learn to, to read right. and so they moved on. Then you had the industrial era. What happened during then? Because as you put more mechanics and pieces in, then what happened? They put a premium on people having mechanical skills, and that gave to a whole rise in the world around vocational schools. And the reason I say that is because whatever this era is going to get called in retrospect, all this data, it is going to put a premium and change because education is the root answer to your question. It's going to put a premium on everywhere in the world a set of skills that are dealing in the information age. And whether that is um, high skilled, medium skilled, or low skilled are going to all be like that. And another whole discussion is the things that I think is incumbent upon all of us in public-private partnership around the world to help governments and countries. We are doing a lot of work on this to build those right skills. So yes, that will happen, but I view this next era, then it's not man versus machine. It is man and machine making a better decision. And that's really why I think it's important to call it augmented intelligence. That is the goal of this. That's the goal we're working on. And I see it. I see it the way doctors work. I see it the way lawyers work. I, I get the chance to watch how people interact. These are like a colleague when they deal with these systems in the right way. So will there be some displacement that will come from a new era? There always is. And will it then be replaced with new jobs we've never thought of? Absolutely. And it's going to happen again. And you can see it already. I mean, there are a lot of jobs out here. You talk about fintech didn't exist as an industry, right? You talk about cybersecurity. Those jobs didn't exist. But, but as well, the lower skilled, it will put a difference in a premium on it. So um, that's my view. I think the way to view it and the goal for this is better decisions and do not forget in total the ability to solve things that couldn't be solved before. Absolutely. I mean, these burdens of healthcare and the environment, they are huge on our world. If you can't get at these, these other points are minor. And this will get at those points. So you made the point in your speech about the financial services sector being an early adopter. I think the point you just made will be advanced when these technologies are in deployed to consumers generally. How far away are we from that? When will my phone have cognitive, sufficient cognitive computing so it can lear learn over time and improve and provide counsel to me as I go about my, my daily work? Well, two things. Uh, that's already happening. All right, so that is already happening. Um, but I don't believe that everything we've talked about today will be driven just by a consumer. When you speak about blockchain and some of the impact to the back office, that will not just be driven by a, a consumer view of some of these things. I think that has been widely learned by everyone now, that that feeling that consumerism has on the enterprise, that's happening. We all know that. We know that things have to be easy to do, consumable, fast, iterative, inside our companies. So that's kind of unleashed already. And so now I think that is going to be more of a, a wildfire through how an op, a company operates uh, versus that, gee, it'll only be because my phone works one way. I, I think we're past that point. I, I think everybody is here. Sir, here. No, I guess. I, I think I, I would summarize it with shareholders. <laughs> now, being, at the end of the day, those inefficiencies, yeah. as I mentioned before, are the reason why we need to embrace this kind of technology 
and, and, and deployed. I think that, of course, we're going to have a transition time. Yeah. Some jobs will be eliminated. Uh, you know, we have demography on our side yeah. that helps. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's clearly uh, some of the people that are uh, in the last uh, phase of their career are not going to be able to retrain for the new jobs. But, you know, uh, uh, thanks God, this is going to be taken care of by demography and, and the evolution. But absolutely critical for us going forward is to embrace those technologies to create a decent, you know, you know, a decent return for shareholders and, and, and creating also better experience for clients. And last but not least, creating better jobs for people working in our industry. And, but in order to achieve that, you will need to really invest also in education because the new jobs in the future won't be the same one. So I think that we need to really think about how to train the next generation of, of, of bankers and, and people working in the financial services industry to work with data rather than uh, 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 being victim of data. I, you know, I, I think it's going to lead to a whole era in education where schools are going to align with businesses to create curriculums that you will that are hireable, you know, that, that industry wants to hire. Um, just a quick last point, uh, a week ago in the U.S., a new bill was signed in, in, uh, in the House here, which aligns for community colleges their curriculum with what people will hire. We've worked four years on getting that bill passed. Yeah. In that it's so important because we've done the work with the schools. If you give the schools the right curriculum, we will hire these kids. And there are all these job openings. And this is true for the, the poorest performing schools. It doesn't matter. So I really think we're going to enter an era of public-private working together in a big way to solve this education issue because, as Sergio just said, it's always the transitions that are the most difficult. Right. Thank you both for your leadership on this in this conversation. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Yeah.